underlying uh, problems in the enzymes of PH2 and primary hepatoglia 3 are poorly characterized and hence I'll not be going into them. Um, going to the clinical presentation. This disease is as complex as it can get in any tubular disorder. So you can have a multitude of presentations in this uh, patients. Quite often we catch them young and quite often the presentation happens earlier, but there is uh, different ends of the spectrum can happen and one can easily be med misled with the presentations of these patients. Almost 60% of these patients uh, do definitely have some onset of some symptoms before 10 years of age and majority almost 83% before 20 years of age. So there's definitely uh, some uh, suspicion can be raised at first instance of these symptoms. And majority of these symptoms are urological symptoms. It is either in the form of stone passage or hematuria or detection of nephrocalcinosis in an ultrasound. The median age at first symptom onset, which is mostly urological, happens around 5.5 years of age, but the age of diagnosis of this condition as primary hyperoxaluria or the definitive diagnosis somewhat delayed around 15 years of age. Uh, there is also that some patients do not present with symptoms even till 30 years or sometimes even older. It's by chance they are uh, uh, detected even asymptomatically or pre-symptomatically. Um, Moving on, but the most difficult and the most um, challenging part is many of these patients, a significant number of these patients uh, end up being recognized only after kidney damage is irreversible and almost 30% of them are found out at the end stage kidney disease at CKD5. And uh, very unfortunately, 10% of the patients with primary hyperoxylia diagnosis have such diagnosis found out only after recurrence in a allograft after kidney transplantation. So they do not have any idea about the basic disease prior to transplantation and unfortunately they lose their grafts after they have a recurrence in their allograft. Uh, there are many registries for this rare disease which sort of gives us an uh, idea of what is the most common presentation and what is the age groups that are affected. Of uh, importance is this rare kidney stone consortium, which has roughly around 800 to 900 patients till date. And it sort of in, uh, includes many, uh, almost all continents in the country and many countries contribute to this registry. So it's a fairly very uh, heterogeneous uh, record of hyperoxaluria and also has multiple ethnicities involved. So of this, um, from this consortium, we know that the PH1, primary hyperoxaluria type 1, remains the predominant uh, uh, diagnosed variety of this condition and it's almost around 68%. Previous registry data has put it at 80%, but it's slowly uh, pH2 and pH3 are being more and more recognized. pH2 is 10% and pH3 almost 11%. So pH3 is the second most common variety, it seems like it. And also, even though patients have classical uh, uh, hyperoxaluria with uh, urine measurements and plasma measurements, up to 11% of them need not show any mutations in their genetic analysis. Uh, so the data from this registry shows that symptom onset can be even in infancy and it can vary as much as uh, just a failure to thrive. And uh, although urological symptoms predominate, urological symptoms could be anything from an imaging finding of a nephrocalcinosis or urolithiasis or having symptoms like hematuria and abdominal pain. And 10% of patients are asymptomatic when they are diagnosed with hyperoxaluria. The age in yours at first symptom Predominantly, as I said, the first symptom could have happened anywhere between five to 10 years of age, and majority do have their first symptom between five to 10 years of age. But uh, there is a gradual tapering, and regardless, first symptoms could happen even in the sixth or the seventh decade of life. So that's what makes this even more challenging at uh, advanced ages. And also the kidney status is age. Very little patients have preserved kidney function, especially with primary hyperoxaluria. Almost ESRD by the third or the fourth decade is the norm in this condition. Patients with pH2 and pH3 might have a variable course, and they might be contributing to the uh, little bit of normal renal function or preserved renal function that you see across the older age groups. But uh, as I keep telling, primary hyperoxia is definitely a spectrum, and that's what that is one of the reasons why these disorders are very complex to diagnose and treat. The spectrum can happen from a devastating infantile oxalosis where options for treatment is very, very minimal. And also patients can present with various symptoms like just failure to thrive in un unrecognized or undiagnosed uh, renal dysfunction to recurrent stone formers to uh, imaging finding of nephrocalcinosis or diagnosis exactly at the last stage of CKD or CKD5 or allograft recurrence. They can also present very mildly with just a history of single stone formation, especially in a child. 
and also asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals can sometimes be diagnosed. Uh, is there any variation in the type of uh, um, hyperoxaluria and the type of clinical presentation that you get? There seems to be uh, more severe forms are usually uh, seen in patients with primary hyperoxaluria. Uh, they present invariably with recurrent urolithiasis, and they have extremely progressive nephrocalcinosis, and most of them and majority of them uh, have uh, ESRD in the first two to three decades of life, and it is almost the norm in patients definitely by the age of 40 to 50 years. But nevertheless, this is a much heterogeneous uh, type of uh, disease, especially PH1. Within the same genotype and within the same families, many people can, different, can present with different types of symptoms and have a varying course of disease. And it's neither based on the specific, so you cannot predict the clinical presentation based on the clinical um, on the specific genotype or even on the level of uh, the enzyme activity. And all this is thought to be because of environmental or epigenetic factors, or uh, there are multiple other factors in your mutation analysis, like post-transcriptional and other things that are going to play a role in the uh, how the disease progresses and how the disease behaves. Um, a primary hyperoxaluria 2 is less heterogeneous in presentation. Most of them, uh, it's a less severe form also than the primary hyperoxaluria type 1. Most patients, however, have severe, uh, severe recurrent uh, urolithiasis leading to a gradual loss of kidney function over time. And the risk of CKD5 uh, in these patients is approximately 20%. And uh, uh, they constitute about 10% of patients with primary hyperoxaluria. And many of them still can go un uh, undiagnosed because of the less severe clinical course. Primary hyperoxaluria type 3 uh, seems to be the second most common type of primary hyperoxaluria. It's more and more recognized now. Um, this type is uh, very interesting in that the urolithiasis sort of starts very early in the first decade of life. But however, as the age progresses, the disease tends to be slightly uh, uh, silent. It becomes clinically silent and uh, not many reports. There are very sparse reports of one or two patients having ended up uh, to end-stage kidney disease with this um, uh, type of hyperoxaluria. But generally, it's believed that primary hyperoxia type 3 would not progress to CKD5 and most patients are just managed conservatively. Uh, the most dreadful clinical presentation, however, is the systemic oxalosis. Uh, the widespread oxalate deposition starts when oxalate production overhelms the kidney excretion, and it can start as early as an EGFR of 30 to 45 ml per minute. Um, it can present in, uh, as I said, no organ is paired with the uh, oxalate deposits. It can uh, affect major organs like the uh, cardiac tissue, resulting in cardiomyopathy, heart blocks, and uh, heart failure. Uh, vascular deposition in the form of non-healing skin ulcers, um, also resulting in skin calcifications and also sometimes causing uh, major organ infarcts have also been like uh, strokes and also been described. Retinal deposits and sometimes dental root resorption occurs with oxalate deposition in the root pockets. Uh, bone, uh, bone seems to be uh, the, uh, uh, the biggest organ that is uh, affected universally in almost all patients because bone is the largest repository of oxalate. The manifestations in bone can be uh, divided into the bone structure and also in the hematological uh, aspects of bone deposition or the marrow deposition. So bone pain and pathological fractures uh, are seen in most patients with advanced systemic oxalosis or especially in those who have late diagnosis. And uh, erythropoietin refractory anemia or transfusion dependent anemia. Uh, and also sometimes uh, patients can present to you with hypersplenism at the first go. Um, with refractory or ex, uh, excessive oxalate deposition in the bone marrow, prohibiting uh, um, all the cell lines in the marrow. Uh, peripheral neuropathy and autonomic dysfunction resulting in refractory hypotension have also been described. Um, so these are some pictures showing the uh, extensive systemic oxalosis and their uh, devastating complications. This shows non-healing skin ulcers, almost... Um, and necrotic areas that you see in the thigh of this patient. And this picture shows some lytic lesions in the bone. There is so much bone damage in osteopathy that there can be uh, lytic lesions and poor bone structure and also resulting in fractures and bone pain. Retinal calcium oxalate deposits rarely uh, affecting visual disturbance also uh, can happen, one systemic oxalosis. And it's quite a, a very good screening tool to identify systemic oxalation, oxalate deposits in these patients. Um, the diagnosis of hyperoxaluria, uh, this disease being rare and being very heterogeneous in its presentation, you need a high index of suspicion 
to uh, diagnose primary hyperoxaluria, and it should be suspected in any uh, combination of clinical, radiological, or laboratory features. Uh, any patient with recurrent nephrolithiasis, either uh, confirmed by renal ultrasound or an X-ray or a computer tomography, showing in multiple bilateral radio opaque uh, densities, having nephrocalcinosis, which can be either medullary, it can be corticomedullary, which is often seen in older children and adults, or uh, diffuse uh, nephrocalcinosis, which is often seen in uh, infants. A child with a first kidney stone should be definitely evaluated for primary hyperoxaluria. Any infant with failure to thrive along with impaired kidney function, the presence of renal dysfunction or end-stage kidney disease at any age with history of renal stones or nephrocalcinosis, a stone composition of pure calcium oxalate monohydrate, uh, uh, especially uh, pure or more than 95% of those stones showing calcium oxalate in its monohydrate form, or any oxalate crystals identified in a biological fluid or tissue. All of these situations warrant intense and uh, focused um, uh, investigation to rule out a diagnosis of hyperoxaluria. Uh, often, uh, we uh, start with stone analysis. As I said, many of these patients present with urological symptoms of the first go. So either after stone passage or a stone diagnosed and you attempt a urological intervention, you get a stone which could be sent for analysis. Calcium oxalate is a main stone component and particularly its monohydrate form if it's present, uh, if it constitutes more than 95% of the stone. Um, it should be uh, considered a very pathognomonic of uh, hyperoxaluria. Uh, the also uh, uh, people have uh, shown that macroscopic and microscopic appearance of these calcium oxalate stones compared to calcium oxalate monohydrate stones of other causes of say an idiopathic cause could differ very, uh, could be very different. So primary hyperoxaluria enzyme deficiency confers a specific architecture to these stones uh, in, in uh, hinting at a different pathogenic mechanism at play here. So these stones are usually pale compared to the uh, stones, uh, calcium oxalate monohydrate stones that are not from patients with primary hyperoxidia. So these are darker, but the patients from, for the stones from primary hyperoxidia are very pale. And they also see that they are more porous and they are more rugged in appearance compared to the uh, non-primary hyperoxidia stones, which have a, a radiating sort of an inner core and an outer core and a well-defined architecture. Uh, so these things can give you a clue. So usually stone analysis is uh, attempted and you should ask for a spectroscopy, uh, infrared spectroscopy to identify the monohydrate form. So be, um, um, uh, it is important that you request this uh, test when you attempt a stone analysis. Um, the second uh, most uh, informative and the most uh, easily available tests are the 24-hour urine collection for uh, various urinary metabolites. So you are going to deal with a child or an adult or an adolescent with uh, a high stone load. So urine analysis uh, should always be attempted for a 24-hour collection. And uh, it is useful to do not only oxalate, but also look at the calcium, citrate, sodium, and uric acid, and the uh, magnesium levels in all, in all these samples. At least the basic oxalate, calcium, and citrate should be attempted in all these patients. Uh, uh, this 24-hour uh, urine uh, examination is especially important in patients who have uh, a preserved renal function. So they are more likely to excrete more of urinary oxalate because they have a good GFR. The normal excretion in normal individuals is less than 0.5 millimoles per 1.73 meters squared. And usually anything more than 0.5, you sh should raise a suspicion of hyperoxaluria. And in primary hyperoxaluria, especially the type 1, the uh, levels of 24-hour urinary oxalate is usually beyond one millimoles. There's too much excretion of oxalate in the urine. Uh, in, especially in infants, sometimes the 24-hour urinary collection might not be possible. And in certain other situations when it's not possible, one can attempt to spot urine uh, oxalate creatinine ratio. There are age-based uh, 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 reference ranges available, but uh, a low creatinine in many of these patients can falsely give a higher ratio and uh, can falsely, uh, uh, false positively diagnose a hyper hyperoxaluria in many of these patients. So repeat collections may be necessary or a confirmation again with a 24-hour collection might be necessary to confirm the diagnosis. Um, 
urinary uh, calcium uh, creatinine ratios might be helpful. Uh, it's especially uh, low or normal in patients with uh, hyperoxaluria. Also, these all, uh, even though these stones are calcium oxalate, many of these patients do not have hypercalciuria. They, in fact, many of them are reported to have low calcium excretion uh, or normal calcium excretion. The exception may be in uh, primary hyperoxaluria type 3, where it's variable, many reports of high calcium excretion has also been reported. It is also an important test to rule out an idiopathic calcium oxalate stone. Some patients might not have hyperoxaluria, but they might be just calcium oxalate stone formers. Many of them do have associated hypercalciuria, so they might form a good supportive diagnosis when you're looking at a patient with hyperoxaluria. So these are the different ranges of uh, urine oxalate uh, excretion uh, based upon age. I've also given the urine glycolate and L-glyceric acid. So uh, L-glyceric acid especially can be elevated in pH2 patients because that is the substrate that is going to be there when the enzyme is deficient. So, uh, and glycolate is usually uh, increased in many of these patients. So, um, because it's a, just a precursor metabolite of the uh, glyoxalate. So you can have, uh, these are supportive tests, although uh, urine oxalate should be fine enough for you to do. And when these uh, these are in the uh, confusion range or you, you do not have definite answers with these tests, you might go ahead and do the other metabolites in the urine. Uh, there are also uh, spot values for the glycerate and the glycolate uh, creatinine ratios, which are available. Uh, the other uh, useful test could be plasma oxalate levels. And this is only attempted most, uh, and it's mostly attempted in patients who have already had significant renal damage and a uh, uh, low GFR. So when you have a low GFR, you're not going to excrete as much urinary oxalate in your urine. So a urine oxalate might uh, falsely tell you that the urine oxalate is normal or it's less and take you away from a diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria when in fact the patient has primary hyperoxaluria. So uh, when there is significant renal dysfunction, please do uh, plasma oxalate levels as opposed to urinary oxalate level. And it also can reflect the systemic oxalate load. And very high increased plasma oxalate can give you a hint of already systemic oxalate deposition happening in that patient. Um, uh, patients with normal renal function can also have sometimes elevated plasma oxalate level because of the supersaturation happening and kidney deposition happening, but this is usually not attempted in them. And in dialysis patients, in dialysis patients, even when you do not have primary hyperoxaluria, because you are excreting anyway very little of endogenous oxalate production, normal endogenous oxalate production, you might have a slightly higher uh, plasma oxalate levels. Uh, but this should not be confused uh, for patients with primary hyperoxaluria. So patients with primary hyperoxaluria and end-stage renal disease have multiple fold increase in their plasma oxalate levels, usually beyond 60 to 80 micromoles per liter. Uh, compared to patients with CKD5 due to other renal causes, where they might have only mild elevation of the plasma oxalate level. Uh, plasma levels, again, of the other metabolites like glycolate and glyceric acid can also be done. Uh, th this could be a chance diagnosis that some of us might uh, step on when you're evaluating a patient with a kidney biopsy for some other reason. Um, kidney biopsy uh, tissue can, some, uh, can also show oxalate deposition. It is shown by polarized microscopy, which shows birefringent crystal deposition. It is shown here. Uh, so usually the situations that we come across are when you do um, an allograft biopsy and you have a surprise on the biopsy, you do it for renal dysfunction of an unknown uh, cause, and then you do not know the basic disease and the uh, allograft biopsy shows this, you know that the primary disease could have been primary hyperoxaluria. And also when you do attempt a native kidney biopsy for unknown etiology for renal dysfunction, you might end up having oxalate deposits and then go on to diagnose a patient with primary hyperoxaluria. Uh, however, more and more we are uh, leaning towards genetic diagnosis for this disease. Uh, genetic tests being uh, becoming more affordable and being more reachable and, approved, and uh, uh, this thing for more patients. We uh, definitely attempt to do a def genetic diagnosis in almost all patients. And uh, PH1 mutations, as I previously discussed, are more well characterized than the uh, other two uh, genes, the mutations or the variants. Um, in PH1, there are four common pathogenic variants which are reported, of which 65% of them are fall between any of these four. 
the first mutation, uh, uh, most of these uh, variants have a missense uh, mutation and uh, missense mutations make up approximately 67% uh, of any of these uh, variants. So uh, deletions and uh, other uh, frame shift and uh, nonsense, del uh, nonsense deletions are all uh, very little. So most of them have missense variants. And uh, you can um, uh, order any of these tests. You can either do a single gene testing with sequence analysis and variant testing or a multi-gene panel or a extensive exome or genome testing. An extensive exome or a genome testing is more and more favored these days because it can rule out other differential causes of uh, recurrent, uh, uh, nephro, recurrent urolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis. So when you have, uh, when you're not very sure of uh, primary hypothetical diagnosis, do include an extensive gene panel or an extensive exome or genome testing so that you uh, include all these stone forming uh, genes into your panel. Uh, so there's uh, a glycine and arginine uh, uh, missense mutation. It's one of the most common uh, variants that is seen in the uh, PH1. Uh, this gene confers it, it slows the rate of dimerization of the AGT monomers. So it decreases the stability of the enzyme and it also uh, exposes the mitochondrial target. So it targets the uh, protein fault state for the, micro, uh, for the mitochondria. So these monomers are imported into the mitochondria rather than the peroxisome. And the pyridoxin, which is used uh, in some of these patients, is also likely attributable and it's useful in these mutations uh, because it, in part, it enhances the dimerization of the AGT enzyme. And that's why in some of these genotype uh, variants, uh, pyridoxin seems to be useful. The other variant that uh, in which has B6 responsiveness has been elaborately studied is the uh, proline leucine uh, variant. Uh, it is a minor allele phenotype. So that also confers some level of B6 hypo, hypo uh, responsiveness. 30% uh, uh, of these patients have a major haplotype uh, uh, variant, uh, uh, which results in a frame shift that, predict, that has a nonsense uh, mutation. So it results in very little enzyme level and very and the early decay of the enzyme compared to the missense mutations and the other three variants, which cause a mislocalization of the enzyme to the mitochondria. The last mutation sort of decreases the enzyme activity completely. There is no mislocalization or mistargeting here. Rather, the enzyme level itself is significantly reduced because of the mutation. Uh, these uh, patients do not respond to pyridoxin. And um, although uh, there is some genotype phenotype correlation, especially uh, uh, to pyridoxin responsiveness, more, much is not known about other variants. And it's uh, advised that all patients receive uh, codes of pyridoxin to check for pyridoxin responsiveness. Um, the other test that could be used to diagnose primary hyperoxaluria, one is the previous gold standard method of doing a liver biopsy and establishing the enzyme activity of the AGT in primary hyperoxaluria one. It is now reserved uh, very rarely uh, done when you're uh, pushed for a diagnosis in a patient, especially prior to transplant, where uh, the clinical, um, uh, the plasma oxalate or the urinary oxalate levels are not conclusive and you do not have any help from the genetic tests also. You, one can go and attempt a liver biopsy and enzyme activity and also, again, uh, in a live related donor evaluation, sometimes you might attempt to look at them because the patient's uh, relative could be a, a carrier, could be a heterozygous carrier, so in whom you might be interested in knowing the enzyme activity before uh, volunteering that donor for donation. Um, so what are the differential diagnosis and what could be the differential diagnosis for this condition? Uh, hyper, once you have hyperoxiduria or you have an increased urinary uh, excretion or an increased plasma oxalate level, um, many of these conditions or an uh, a calcium oxalate stone, the first three conditions could definitely be in your differentials and one needs to take a careful history to rule out all of these conditions. So enteric hyperoxaluria is a condition that has the problem is basically in the small bubble. There is fat mole absorption and there is decreased oxalate reabsorption. Um, uh, increased oxalate, uh, increased oxalate reabsorption, and decreased excretion through the gut. So this can happen in various disorders like celiac disease, chronic pancreatitis, or anything that can any disorder that could cause a short bowel syndrome. Any surgeries that could cause a short bowel syndrome. Dietary hyperoxaluria could be a major uh, thing to rule out, especially in this. Um, um, a situation of people going in for smoothies and juices and salads and all that, sometimes patients could be inadvertently taking too heavy doses of oxalate in their diet, especially lots of choco, cocoa and leafy greens, nuts and peanut butter, and especially star fruit, which is notorious for its oxalate uh, levels. 
um, could also be uh, one of the causes. So make sure that you rule out all these causes or ask in the history for all these causes before you um, uh, end up in evaluating a patient for oxalate uh, oxaluria. Uh, idiopathic calcium oxalate urolithiasis can sometimes um, uh, confuse and uh, uh, complicate a diagnosis uh, evaluation of primary hyperoxaluria. But certain features that would often differentiate this condition is that these patients uh, have lower urinary oxalate excretion compared to primary hyperoxaluria. They have they tend to have less severe stone disease, and they rarely uh, have renal dysfunction, especially progressing to CKD5. And there is a tendency to hypercalciuria uh, as opposed to hypocalciuria in primary hyperoxaluria. The other um, uh, very uh, interesting differential diagnosis would be dense disease because a lot of features do overlap uh, between a primary hyperoxaluria patient and a patient with dense disease. You can have nephrocalcinosis, urolithiasis, renal failure, but however, the X-linked inheritance pattern and hypercalciuria and uh, a genetic diagnosis, a mutation in CLCN5 could take you away from a diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria. So the treatment strategies are complex. They are usually uh, not very uh, efficient and especially the dialysis strategy. And the treatment goals are based on GFR at presentation. So a patient with preserved GFR or early CKD is managed very differently from a patient with advanced acetemia. Your goal for uh, treating a patient with preserved GFR is in uh, reducing the oxalate load and preserving the GFR as much as possible. Whereas in advanced acetemia, it is more uh, likely to prevent and reduce the system systemic oxalosis and other complications of systemic oxalosis. So in a patient with preserved GFR, you follow the uh, uh, fluid hydration, which would dilute the oxalate supersaturation. Uh, roughly two to three liters per square meter body surface area is what is recommended. And crystallization inhibitors like oral potassium citrate or orthophosphate is used to alkalinize urine with the ideal pH being suggested to be between 6.2 to 6.8. Um, in patients with preserved GFR, uh, they need routine monitoring to uh, either uh, to diagnose the GFR progression and also to uh, early identification of systemic oxalosis. So they might need a kidney ultrasound, periodic urine analysis, frequent renal function tests, and also an eye examination, which could be an early sign of systemic oxalate deposits happening. And Dr. Sukanya, sorry to disturb. You have five more minutes. Yeah, sure. So CKD or patients with CKD5 need to be screened very differently. The more focus is on the systemic oxalosis and to examine the multisystemic consequence of oxalosis. So determination of bone density, looking for cardiac deposits of oxalate, uh, evaluating through ECG and echocardiogram, uh, bone x-rays, and sometimes even a bone biopsy could be uh, done to uh, rule out osteopathy. And thyroid function test, um, because of deposition in the glands, could be done. And majority of these patients, the crux of the management prior to transplant remains initiation and maintenance on dialysis. Uh, regardless of the GFR, all these patients should be advised to avoid dehydration from any cause which could lead to irreversible kidney failure and avoid an intake of vitamin C that, ex that, extends, uh, that exceeds the RDA, which can uh, promote oxalosis, loop diuretics, NSAIDs and other nephrotoxic agents and large intake of foods high in oxalate should be avoided in all these patients. The other uh, conservative treatment strategy would uh, be in pyridoxin. I've already discussed about pyridoxin's role and how it helps. So pyridoxin should uh, response and it should be tested in almost all patients, regardless of genetic testing and the variant that you get. Start at a dose of 5 mg per kg and you can go up to a maximum 20 mg per kg. Uh, there are no side effects and a minimum trial period of three months is described. And the response in is described as at least a 30% reduction in the urine oxalate levels from initiation of treatment. So you can discontinue uh, pyridoxin if there's no response in three months duration. Probiotics are often discussed as one of the uh, this thing uh, for decreasing intestinal oxalate excretion, but it seems to be very little and doing very little for these patients with um, extra and super heavy loads of oxalate in their blood. So dialysis remains a main uh, strategy, uh, but most patients have been starting dialysis younger compared to the previous year. So we do have this trend of starting dialysis early in these patients. But however, despite that, these patients have poorer survival of, um, uh, despite, uh, compared to other kidney diseases. 
conventional hemo, uh, the reason for this is that conventional hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are often poor removal, uh, uh, confer poor removal of the oxalate, and they uh, do not remove, uh, they are not good uh, sources to remove oxalate at all. So you need more intensive strategies to uh, clear the plasma oxalate level. So uh, the strategies in dialysis could include short daily uh, sessions of high flux dialysis. So use a high flux dialyzer, nocturnal dialysis, uh, often five to six days in a week, a combination of hemodialysis and nocturnal peritoneal dialysis can also be attempted because often plasma levels rebound after hemodialysis session. Uh, the goal should be to keep the pre-dialysis levels of plasma oxalate to below to 30 to 45 micromoles per liter. Transplant, however, remains the mainstay of treatment and should be offered to almost all patients with this condition. As liver is the sole organ responsible for this glyoxalate, unless you change the liver, this disease is not going to get better. So excessive production is going to continue as long as the liver is there. So preemptive liver transplant prior to onset of kidney dysfunction has been variously described, but however, the ethics of um, doing a kidney uh, liver transplant and uh, uh, doing, it, doing it in a child and putting them on lifelong immunosuppression is being questioned. Uh, most centers do a liver and combined kidney transplant. It could either be done simultaneously or it could be done sequentially. There are many advantages of doing it sequentially because you have a liver which is reducing the oxalate load. Systemic oxalosis comes down by the time you keep an allograft in them. Combined liver kidney has also been attempted and is done, especially in the disease donor setting. The donor could be either a living or the deceased donor, and you can also have a same donor, the liver and kidney from the same deceased donor or from a living donor or from different donors. So various strategies are being used. The numbers are very little to discuss what's the benefit over one over the other. Kidney transplant alone can be tried in primary hypoxaluria. As I previously discussed, the enzyme is ubiquitous. Liver cell transplant has sparingly been tried in patients, especially in infantile oxalosis, where none of these dialysis or dialysis being ineffective, none of these multi-organ transplants are viable in these patients. Liver cell transplant is uh, attempted uh, in some centers. Um, also, after transplant, you might have to continue hemodialysis or hemofiltration in many of these patients to reduce the systemic oxalate load and that uh, to prevent the oxalate deposits in the uh, allograft. Urinary oxalate excretion may have uh, may remain elevated for many years, and for this reason, um, many of these patients might be uh, forced uh, should have increased fluid intake and also use of crystallization inhibitors. The future therapeutic strategies, however, is promising for this condition with something called the substrate reduction therapy being uh, advocated and being tested in the recent years. So substrate reduction therapy, especially the drug Lumasiran or Oxilmo, is being uh, studied in many uh, phase three trials now and is shown to effectively reduce urinary oxalate uh, production and also systemic oxalate loop. There are also other uh, uh, methodologies and method, uh, strategies being uh, tried and tested. But I'm going to keep it short only about the Lumasiran because of a shortage of time. So this is an ideal substrate reduction therapy uh, target because um, an ideal uh, substrate reduction therapy should actually be a key step in the oxalate metabolic pathway and should inhibit the target and the off-target uh, and, the, and uh, the effects of such therapy should have minimal side effects. So this um, enzymes of glyoxalate, glycolate oxidase and LDH are good targets for such a substrate reduction therapy. So what does Lumasiran do? So Lumasiran is an mRNA, uh, is a liver directed RNA uh, therapeutic target of mRNA of glycolate oxidase. So this, when done, it um, takes over the function of glycolate oxidase and reduces the oxalate production down uh, the stream of uh, that oxalate metabolism. So it is administered subcutaneously at a dose of three to six milligram per kg per dose. There are also weight-based schedules that's being used in various trials. It can be administered once monthly for three doses and then a maintenance of once every three months is what is uh, predominantly used in these trial. And injection site reaction remains the uh, most uh, difficult side effect with this drug. So uh, there are a lot of uh, trials going on. Uh, this is the first trial which compared healthy participants and uh, patients with primary hyperoxaluria and administration of this agent increased the plasma glycolate concentration, which is the um, agreed and which is the expected effect of this drug. So the previous metabolite is increased. So there's no increased oxalate uh, in the blood. And it also reduces the 24 urinary oxalate reduction, both in healthy volunteers and patients. And also in the Illuminate A, 
uh, which looked at patients who are more than six years old and have a GFR of more than 30, uh, definitely uh, compared to placebo, lumasiran decreased the oxalate, uh, 24 hour urinary oxalate reduction. Uh, the Illuminate B is based on, uh, it's an open label trial, which included infants and young children with the preserved GFR, and also similar results were seen in this uh, uh, trial. The Illuminate C is a single arm open label trial, which looks at uh, patients with severe renal impairment of all ages, and uh, uh, patients who are hemodialysis dependent are also being enrolled in this trial. Um, so uh, I'll leave you with this. So we have discussed various strategies, the devastating complications of this uh, uh, disease. So this is a rare yet devastating disease and often results in end-stage renal disease. The diagnosis itself is very complex and is often missed in uh, our clinical um, in various clinical scenarios. And effective treatment strategies are only now evolving. Uh, preserving GFR and preventing or decreasing systemic oxalosis remain the mainstay or the main goals of therapy. Intensive dialysis, Offering multi-organ transplant to these patients, especially primary hyperoxaluria 1, should be done in all these patients. And substrate reduction therapies uh, remain best future treatments to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sokenia. Thank you so much for this uh, detailed uh, overview of the hyperoxaluria. And this explains what the vari genetic variation is basically which leads us to the clinical heterogeneity of the disease, but good to have the newer substrate inhibitors with us. So we'll be taking the questions at the end and thank you so much for your time you gave to us. Now we'll proceed on to our second speaker, Dr. Pro uh, Professor Dr. Edmund Fernando, uh, sir is head of department of nephrology and transplantation at the Stanley Medical College and is a senior consultant is a senior consultant at Dr. Mehta's group of hospital. Dr. Fernando has special interest in the living and cadaveric renal transplantation. And as is rightly said that a nephrologist's job is never completed even post-transplant, particularly the fine tuning of the metabolic abnormalities. So Dr. Fernando will highlight on the electrolyte imbalance in the renal transplant recipients, the post-renal transplant patients. So Dr. Fernando, the mic is yours. You can continue. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Slides are visible. Yes. Yeah, right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kalivani, and uh, greetings to the chairperson from Karachi. And good evening, all. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to all of you in this forum today. And as the chairperson rightly mentioned, this is an area that's not being paid much attention to because we don't have time to really look into this. As long as somebody's graph function is normal and he doesn't have fever and doesn't, doesn't have any other infection or other complications, we are quite happy. But this is uh, something that's silently going on in even stable renal transplant recipients. So I bring to you warm greetings from the Norman Stanley Medical College, which the 200 year old hospital and the 80 year old medical college. So, this is a study of 76 renal transplant recipients whose electrolyte imbalance in the first 72 hours this is a pediatric uh, cohort. So, you find uh, hyporetremia nearly about 59%, hyperkalemia about 30%, and acidosis in 57%. So, I shall concentrate on these three aspects alone. This is another cohort of 576 patients in whom uh, post-transplant electrolyte imbalances were studied. And what you see here is the, the number of patients and the, the different uh, uh, electrolyte and mineral disturbances that can, happen, that can happen, starting from hypomagnesemia to hypokalemia. And these charts indicate that there are two electrolyte 
or even three and four electrolyte and mineral metabolism disorders in these transplant recipients. So what shall be what we shall be covering in the next uh, uh, half an hour or so is metabolic disorders post transplant disorders of sodium and then disorders of potassium. So we'll talk about metabolic acidosis first. Uh, as I mentioned, that our attention is focused on immunological, cardiovascular, infectious, and other relevant clinical complications the transplant setting. And this routine assessment of this metabolic complication is not routinely done. And there's also no major reference to this in the KDGO guidelines in the care of transplant patients. It is a neglected area, but of potential clinical relevance. Chronic metabolic acidosis in CKD uh, happens whenever there's a bicarb is low and the pH levels are low. There's a proportional decrease in PCO2. With a GFR of less than 30 mils, there's a tenfold higher prevalence of chronic metabolic acidosis. And metabolic acidosis contributes to increased morbidity and mortality of CKD patients and to progression of renal disease. Chronic metabolic acidosis accelerates progression of kidney disease. So metabolic acidosis, a high dietary intake, leads to a single nephron ammoniogenesis that is increased. It activates the complement. This further worsens the tubular interstitial Injury, the increased aldosterone contributing to glomerulosclerosis and decline in renal function. So what is the impact of these chronic metabolic uh, acidosis is increased albumin catabolism, reduced insulin sensitivity, reduced oxygen delivery at tissue level, increased beta to globulin production, muscle wasting, reduced bone formation, increased bone resorption, growth retardation, especially in children, and in kidney uh, function because of the ammonium-dependent complement activation, endothelin and aldosterone effects, it contributes to CKD progression. So this is the prevalence of chronic metabolic acidosis in different studies. And you see here that it ranges from something like 12% up to a high of about 60%. This is all a cohort of post-transplant patients. So the reasons why there is such a wide variability is because of the these different eras in which these studies were done, and what was the threshold that was used to diagnose metabolic acidosis. And these studies are not constant about the timing in which this was studied, and of course, the difference in graph function. So, again, here this is bicarbonate at the first month post transplant, and this is a 12th month post transplant. You find that the acidosis improves from 27% to about 16%. So what is the pathogenesis? These are mechanisms common to acidosis in CKD and mechanisms specific in the transplant setting. So in the CKD, there is a reduction in capacity of the disease kidneys to eliminate the hydrogen ion load. So there is a reduced activity of both enzymes and carrier proteins responsible for the glutamine reabsorption, synthesis and secretion of ammonia and bicarb transport. Why are relevant acid-based changes observed? only when the GFR falls to the 20% of the normal values. This is because the compensatory mechanisms put in act by the residual renal nephrons, which can increase up to threefold their capacity of producing ammonia and eliminating the net acidity. In the transplant setting, there are different uh, factors that operate. One is immunological factors, the effect of immunosuppressive drug, the donor characteristics, renal tubular acidosis, diet and other factors. The donor factors, it has been observed that chronic metabolic acid is significantly higher in the disease donor transplant recipients. This we have observed even in our institution. And metabolic acidosis is consistently higher in the period immediately following transplant, indirectly suggesting that there is a possible role of donor age, donor renal function, and cold ischemia duration of the occurrence of post-transplant chronic metabolic acidosis. Regarding the immunological factors, few case reports of early occurring hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that may be associated with acute rejection. Sometimes it's antedating by one to two weeks and a late occurring CMA associated with histological findings of chronic allograft injury. And immune mediated injury could be involved with the down regulation of the hydrogen ATPS pump and of the chloride bicarb exchanger in the distal tube. So the plausible explanation of immune-mediated factors in the pathogenesis of RPA of kidney transplant recipients 
needs to be fully demonstrated. Regarding the role of immunosuppressive drugs, the commonly used drugs that are calcineurin inhibitors, mycophenolate, and steroids. With CNI, we have a renal tubular acidosis that can happen in about 20% of patients, both proximal and distal RPA have been reported. The RTA-inducing effects of CNI are, seem to be dose-dependent. Reduction of dosage reported to be often associated with the recovery of the RTA. Proximal RTA is characterized by bicarb wasting due to toxicity of CNI, and RTA is more frequent in patients of tacrolimus than on cyclostro. And the RTA associated with CNI is often characterized by high potassium levels, a type 1B or a rate limited RTA. The CNIs induce tubular dysfunction responsible for RTA. So the, the peptidyl proteal cis trans isomerase activity is blocked. This, uh, so this cyclosporin induces RTA by a specific cyclophilin dependent mechanism, but not involving calcineurin inhibition. And tacrolimus can affect several major transport proteins in the renal control of acid base balance, such as the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump and the anion exchange of one. So, this is how hydrogen is handled in the distal tubule. Uh, this is the type 1 intercalated cell where we have the chloride bicarb exchanger, the hydrogen potassium ATPase. And then in type B intercalated cell, you have the hydrogen potassium ATPase uh, in the um, basolateral membrane and the pendrin that drives the chloride bicarb exchanger. And in the non A, non B intercalated cell, you have the pendrin associated chloride bicarb and the hydrogen potassium ATPase. So these intercalated cells switch phenotypes mediated by a substance called hensin. There is increased activity of type A intercalated cell and increased activity of type B intercalated cells, depending upon whether the acidosis is metabolic or respiratory or if it is alkalosis. So what is this hensin? Cyclosporin inhibits the polymerization of hensin. So normally, whenever there is metabolic acidosis, there is polymerization of hensin. This causes extracellular matrix deposition of hensin. And this makes a beta intercalated cell switch functions to an alpha intercalated cell. Now, cyclosporin inhibits this hensin. Other drugs like furosemide can cause type 1 RTA, high dose of vitamin D can cause a type 1 RTA, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, again a type 1 RTA, ACE inhibitors and ARBs cause a type 4 RTA. An increased dietary acid load is associated with metabolic acidosis in transplant recipients. In the presence of subclinical tubular defects like incomplete RTA, an increased load of acids could make the metabolic disturbance overt. So, in early post-transplant, there seems to be a predominance of type 2 RTA, while in late post-transplant, you have more of a type 1 RTA. So, what are the types of RTA prevalent in the post-transplant setting? So, this is uh, given in this graph. The distal RTA seems to be more common than proximal RTA. So what is the impact of chronic metabolic acidosis in the transplant recipients? Not much uh, news in the literature. Most of the studies are extrapolated from studies on CKD patients in various states. But what seems to matter is the potential negative effect of chronic metabolic acidosis on bone demineralization adults and worse height growth in transplant children. So these are areas of concern. So does it really matter that we identify and treat CMA in patients uh, and kidney transplant recipients? Again, because there is paucity of data does not imply there is lack of clinical significance. Prevalence of RTA is consistently higher than that expected by the degree of graft function. It has got potential consequences on both patient and graft outcomes and checking for and correcting metabolic acidosis is definitely easy and cheap. So how do you go about treating, approaching this, uh, these patients? Uh, a CMA with high serum anion gap, look for general clinical conditions and drugs, withdraw them and adjust their doses. With a normal anion gap and hyperchloremic acidosis, if the potassium is more than 5.2, we'll have to check for drugs like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and consider adjusting the dose and adding oral, oral soda makeup. If there is a metabolic acidosis, a normal anion gap, hyperchloremic acidosis, if the potassium is normal or low, look for GI causes, 
look for drugs and then consider withdrawal or reduction of the dosage and add potassium or magnesium citrate. If none of the above drugs are implicated, check for the levels of CNI. If high, reduce the dose of CNI. Consider shifting TAC to cyclosporin, add oral soda mica or potassium magnesium citrate. If it is normal or low, consider acute or chronic rejection, probably decides you, decide, helps you to decide on a biopsy. Add oral sodium bicarb or potassium magnesium citrate. So this is the uh, mechanisms involved uh, uh, in uh, renal acid excretion and consecutive systemic metabolic acidosis. We have a single kidney. There's definitely a reduced nephron mass. There is impaired renal acid excretion. A transplant kidney cannot give a GFR like that of a normal kidney. And uh, there is general tubular damage. There's acidosis, impaired ammonia, ammonia genesis, impaired distal hydrogen ion secretion. There is decrease in the Henson polymerization. The use of calcineurin inhibitors. All this contribute to the metabolic acidosis. So... When we were discussing this, we thought we should look at our data about uh, metabolic acidosis. We have an active uh, live related and uh, disease donor program. This is a publication made by our team at the Stanley Medical College. Uh, we published this in the Indian Journal of Nephrology in 2019, where we found there was a significant effect, prevalence of distal RTA, even with adequate graph function. And screening for these on a regular basis is a feasible and cost-effective approach for early diagnosis. So the significant association that we found in our study was previous acute rejection episodes, current serum tacrolimus trough levels, cotrimoxazole intake, and animal protein intake were associated with acidosis. So with this, I move to the sodium uh, post-transplant. Post-transplant polyuria. This is something that we commonly see. So this could be aquaresis or solute diuresis. Aquaresis is excessive free water intake. Hypotonic fluid infusion. Of course, we are all, as nephrologists, we are very careful with this. Transient NDI from NDI's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus from suboptimal tubular function. And unmasking of a CDI with a functioning transplant. Or it could be a solute diuresis where there is prior urea and uremic metabolite accumulation, natriuresis from saline infusions, and suboptimal immediate transplant tubular reabsorptive functions. And whenever there is a neurological disorder in the early post transplant period, one has to definitely consider hyponatremia. Of course, we do consider hypertensive encephalopathy, press, CVAs, infections, etc. So, Especially in the pediatric age group, uh, the dangers of hyponatremia post renal transplant are uh, too evident. Hyponatremic encephalopathy can happen in children at an average sodium of about 120 with cerebral edema and death. Meticulous post operative fluid management, especially in the pediatric kidney transplant recipients, is exceptionally important to minimize the risk of adverse neurological complications. Measures to avoid hyponatremia, of course, to use the crystalloid. This is the first choice for volume restu restoration. Uh, half normal saline for urine replacement. Then monitor the serum sodium every four hours. And dialysis is performed the day prior to a preemptive transplant to minimize the precipitous drop in osmolality that can occur post transplant. Coming to potassium post transplant, the causes of hyperkalemia calcineurin inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers potassium-containing phosphate supplements and underlying metabolic acidosis. So this is how the potassium is handled in the distal tubule. You're all aware about this potassium channel here at the, the luminal side and the 3-sodium, 2-potassium ATPase. And of course, you have the aldosterone receptor that is situated inside the cell. Now, how does calcineurin inhibitor induce hyperkalemia? Inhibition of luminal potassium channel. Reduce activity of the sodium potassium channel in the basolateral membrane and increase chloride reabsorption that prevents generation of a lumen negative potential. All this contribute to hypokalemia. Now, uh, one has to also keep in mind pseudo hypoaldosteronism. Hypokalemia and metabolic acidosis following cyclosporin in transplant 
may be associated with the down regulation of the mineralocorticoid receptor expression of the peripheral leukocytes and there is the interaction between immunophilin and the mineralocorticoid receptor that is leads to impairment of the mr signaling pathway and could lead to pseudo aldosterone what is the role of fludrocortisone in this group of patients uh, it causes a significant decrease in the potassium within 48 hours the range the dose ranges from 0.1 to 0.4 mg per day duration may be up to 14 days of therapy causes of hypokalemia post transplant dietary potassium restriction overzealous use of diuretics underlying hypomagnesemia may potentiate hypokalemia and the mtor inhibitor sirolimus is known to produce hypokalemia but more than this it is the intense diuresis that can happen that happens post transplant that contributes to hypokalemia so uh, i would conclude here by saying electrolyte disturbances in the renal transplant recipients are common and may have significant effects on both short term and long term outcomes including cardiovascular disease and post transplant bone disease so i stop here and uh, i'll be happy to take a few questions thank you dr fernando thank you so much for uh, an overview regarding particularly the acidosis tubular acidosis post transplant and its various etiologies so we'll proceed on to the q and a and we'll see the questions related to dr sukanya and uh, sir so the first question was where to get the plasma oxalate level in india that dr sukanya can respond plasma oxalate level is uh, definitely done in india and uh, we do routinely that in evaluation of a donor and uh, sometimes uh, as a part of a live uh, related uh, transplant sometimes to just rule out hyperoxaluria in the donor or something like that and also in patients with as i said preserved gfr plasma oxalate it is it is available i can mm -hmm. pass on the question is asked by dr anshman saha so i can pass on the labs that they would do labs like lal path very widely available they do plasma oxalate levels also these levels are quite often used in patients who have undergone a transplant a successful say a combined liver kidney or a isolated kidney uh, isolated liver to check how efficient the transplant is working especially the liver transplant in looking at the plasma oxalate levels so sometimes we monitor the serial levels we do uh, say or every 15 days depending on the unit protocol so it's definitely part of your uh, management and it's definitely available in india uh, uh, most standard labs and very good uh, labs which have branches across in major labs to do it i will pass on the details to dr saha if he or needs it i will contact him yeah thank you thank you thank you dr sukumar can i can i add to that uh, madam yes yes sir if you are trying to diagnose primary hyperoxaluria by looking at oxalate levels most patients come in quite late so as the gfr reduces the oxalate uh, levels also tend to reduce so sometimes if you are going to use it for diagnosis of a, a ckd patient with oxalosis based on plasma oxalate may not really work out and of course we now have uh, better methods of diagnosis yes. thank you thank you so much uh so the other question i think was already responded in dr govindan's uh, presentation that yes we have the urinary levels to detect other substrates like glycolic acid ureas so that answers the questions of the our colleague the other question uh, is uh, regarding should pyridoxine be continued when on dialysis and what is the adequate dose when on dialysis and could it be administered iv post hemodialysis so to uh, entry three queries Yeah, all right. So uh, taking should pyridoxine be continued while on dialysis? Yes. So pyridoxine is an effective strategy in patients who are responsive to reduce the systemic oxalate load. Also, as I said, the pyridoxine makes the enzyme in into its uh, accelerates the enzyme dimerization. It increases activity. It increases the stability. So regardless of the GFR status or whether you're on dialysis, pyridoxine would act in such patients also. 
it would uh, reduce the systemic oxalate load if such patient is going to be responsive. So being on dialysis should not uh, make you hesitant to start pyridoxine in your patient. Uh, I would not think that there is a different dose for patients on dialysis because there is a water-soluble vitamin and does not accumulate in your body when you're on dialysis. So there is no specific dose or anything that would you would change for a patient on dialysis. But the general guidance is to start at a particular dose and increase till you have a uh, uh, you know, your effect. The only problem with starting uh, pyridoxine and monitoring a patient while on pyridoxine, while on dialysis would be, you're not going to go by your urinary oxalate level. So how would you actually uh, try and assess the responsiveness? So that is more a question rather than whether pyridoxine could be used. Uh, so for me, if I were to see a patient in the end stage and he's already, he or she is already on dialysis and whereas I do not have the genetics to assist me to uh, look at the pyridoxine responsiveness, definitely give a trial of pyridoxine. I don't think there would be any harm in giving pyridoxine to them. Although um, I would quickly take them on to transplant to look at uh, other better options for them, but definitely try pyridoxine in the meanwhile. There's no contraindication to start that in the patient with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, pyridoxine, uh, uh, pyridoxine being a water soluble vitamin could be mm -hmm. removed during dialysis and uh, giving it as a oral dose or an IV dose wouldn't matter but I think it should be given post dialysis on dialysis days at least uh, that could probably increase the effect of the medicine more yes. and since there is no uh, severe harm so it's better as you have suggested to be continued on dialysis patients even Thank you so much. And the, the dose one. is definitely much higher than what you would normally prescribe. Hmm. So it is it is not the, uh, we do give pyridoxine when we give INH, etc. But the dose should definitely be a much higher dose. Yes. If, if, uh, if, it is, uh, if it is intended for the purpose that uh, we are giving, especially in patients with hyperoxaluria. The other comment uh, with your permission, ma'am, yes, uh, is... Uh, Patients with primary hyperpara can be mistaken for oxalosis. Of course, now we have genetic uh, diagnosis. But somebody has bilateral stones, has developed renal failure. They can have... Um, uh, uh, I've seen a couple of patients in whom oxalosis was missed. And parathyroidectomy was done thinking it was a primary hyperpara. Oh. So this uh, has to be kept in mind. So this is very important where our urinary and the serum substrate levels are very important to differentiate among this very important differential diagnosis. You are very right, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your response, sir. And the last is question in the QA and box is again for Dr. Govindan. A child with medullary nephrocalcinosis presents with end-stage renal disease. Genetic analysis and plasma oxalate level is inconclusive. There is family history of sibling death with renal stones in the first decade. Parents are keen on transplant. How to proceed? Should combined liver and kidney transplant be offered in this case, ma'am? Yeah, uh, so quite a challenging question. It's been uh -huh. a fellow, so I think as, as challenging as a student could uh, challenge a teacher. So okay. uh, there are two, a couple of things in this. So this patient definitely has a setting and has to be extensively evaluated to rule out a primary hyperoxiduria, especially in the context of attempting a kidney or a combined liver and kidney transplant in this patient. So the genetic analysis and plasma oxalate levels uh, remaining inconclusive, I think we should at least attempt to completely look for evidence of systemic oxalosis in, the, in such patients. The patient being end stage and has probably not been, you know, um, no other forms of treatment being available. There definitely there must be every attempt made to um, look at systemic oxalosis if possible. And, um, the other uh, or, or this thing option is looking at the uh, enzyme level activity, at least for primary hyperoxaluria type 1. That is uh, definitely attempted in certain centers like uh, multi-organ transplant centers, at least in our part of the country. Uh, this level activity is also uh, used to see whether uh, sometimes in the diagnosis in plant cells. So these are two things that one could attempt and uh, try and find if it helps your diagnosis or refutes your diagnosis of primary hypoxuria. Uh, that also being very inconclusive, often we do come across patients or patients do not have the financial resources to go on keeping evaluated. I think it's a very, very cautious and a very uh, 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 team uh, uh, discussion, both with the parents and the family, 
before attempting an isolated kidney transplant. I would not upfront without a diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria go and suggest a, a very uh, complex surgery like a liver and kidney transplant to anybody without a diagnosis that definitely would not be offered unless we have a proven diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria. Again, while attempting an isolated kidney transplant, every uh, due diligence should be given to the health of the allograft, to the possible consequences of a misdiagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria both to the parents, to the patient, everybody in the team should be alert to such a possibility. And uh, it should be, it would be very grave if such a, this thing should be uh, done. And uh, one thing that uh, can be offered is a, a deceased donor transplant rather than attempting a live related transplant in such patients. Often in India, many patients go on to receive a live kidney from a related donor. So if uh, you're really you're pushed to do transplant in a patient without a diagnosis, and primary hyperoxia are still not being ruled out conclusively, or at least a deceased donor transplant. So this is how one should be approaching this patient. Thank you. The other thing is when you look for systemic oxalosis, simple things that we can do is do a bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow where, where the oxalose, oxalate can get deposited. Other thing that we can do is ask a vascular surgeon to take a biopsy from the vessel wall while doing AV fistula. And a diligent fundus examination, optic fundi examination also can show deposition of oxalate, especially when the oxalate load is very high. We have seen a couple of patients who had oxalate deposits in the retina. And uh, uh, very recently, <clears throat> where a patient could not afford a genetic uh, uh, testing, we had a biopsy done from the radial artery, and that showed extensive oxalate deposits. So that should at least not to confirm a diagnosis, but at least you know it's oxalosis and you would not venture out into a kidney alone transplant, but look at a liver kidney transplant. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, precious comments and detailed comments on the questions. And very rightly considering it as a systemic entity, so we have opportunities from the number of places to detect the oxalate deposits. Uh, one, my query regarding uh, this oxalosis, uh, if we have initial presentation, with the stone before patient become dialysis dependent or end stage with the evidence of oxalosis. So can we embark on the liver transplant earlier? Your comments, sir, Dr. Fernando or Dr. Uh, the earlier, the consensus was to do a combined liver kidney transplant. Okay. If it is a proven oxalosis. Mm -hmm. Now people talk about sequential liver kidney transplant. Uh, 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 that is, you do a liver transplant, Hmm. allow the all the oxalate to be metabolized and then get deposited on the kidney and then plan a, a kidney transplant. So this is uh, what people think about it right now. Hmm. So anyway, uh, Sukhania has uh, read more extensively. She'll be able to tell us. To go for hepatic uh, earlier and then yes. look for the renal status. Sequential, sequential transplant. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so see liver transplant or a preemptive liver transplant, uh, uh, exactly what you asked, has many issues uh, inherent with it. Although uh, in a patient with preserved GFR, one might think that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a pre preemptive liver transplant would take away the, uh, the faulty liver and uh, reduce the oxalate load and uh, pre prevent the kidneys from getting... Prevents the kidney going to the... Um, often we see there are a lot of ethical issues in it. If the child is going to be young, how preemptive is good? how preemptive is going to be, you know, there's already some amount of chronic kidney disease that has been set in with ex excessive oxalate deposition. And they might continue for quite a while, even after a preemptive liver transplant. The ethics of uh, giving uh, lifelong immunosuppression and uh, giving immunosuppression at such a young age when the uh, otherwise with a functional liver and a functional kidney is also being debated. The only advantage, or at least on paper, for doing a preemptive liver might be uh, or com uh, compared to a, you know, a more morbid surgery of a combined liver, kidney, or a combined uh, or a sequential liver and kidney, mm -hmm. you get one organ transplant, liver being okay. less antigenic, less prone for rejection. Mm -hmm. The immunosuppressive doses or the cumulative immunosuppression when you embark on a combined or a multi-organ transplant might be very little. Awesome. Yes. Uh, evidence up against or for is still evolving. Very few centers do preemptive uh, liver transplants. 
but we, uh, uh, what is needed is a combined decision and uh, discussing all the pros and cons with the family, with the team, and knowing what you're pushing the patient into and what are your goals at the start of uh, initiating such a transplant, taking such a decision is very important. Mm -hmm. So everything has its plus and minuses. You have to monitor them closely. So in our panelists, we have Sir Dr. Namalwar also with us. So I'd like to take Sir's opinion and comments regarding both our topics of discussion today. So you are with us. I'm, I'm there. Yes, sir. Uh, you there. are audible. audible sir. But it is very difficult for me to take some, speak something more than what Dr. Um, um, Dr. Mrs. Govindan and uh, Dr. Edwin has spoken. Both have been professorial talks. I learned a lot, particularly the aspect of uh, metabolic disorders in transplant. We are so concerned with rejection, infection, and drug aggression, we tend to forget. And uh, we leave, I leave it to a junior uh, youngsters to manage those problems. I think it's been a terrific eye open for me. And of course, Dr. Sukunesko in the South case has been always perfect, and today is more perfect. Thank you, both of you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your feedback and your comments. Uh, so we, I think we have, we'll check last time the Q&A, I think it, we are done. Liver biopsy was asked, so we are already done that we can review all the organs in the body for auxiliary deposits. Uh, so can I ask one question for Dr. Fernandez? So we yes. discussed uh, regarding the CI, CNIs as the culprit for the renal tubular acidosis. So is there any certain level of the CNI levels or any certain duration post-transplant that we are getting this uh, acidosis, the tubular disorder, CNI? No, no ma'am. Uh, all this is demonstrated at whatever stage of transplant. And uh, though people have uh, shown that uh, higher levels are associated with this acidosis, there is no proven relationship in this. And uh, there is positive literature on this also. CNI being a very, very important drug, especially in the first year post-transplant. Yes, uh, I don't think anybody would uh, try to reduce the levels of CNI in order to prevent metabolic acidosis. Yes, uh, probably we would continue the CNI and treat the metabolic acidosis by whatever way we, we could. So there, there's no uh, data to say that this particular level is associated with metabolic acidosis. So in your and, uh, experience, sir, even with the normal CNI levels, you are in, uh, getting acidosis and managing accordingly. Yes, because uh, it is not only the CNI, it's very difficult to find out which is the cause because exactly. the, the GFR of the transplant kidney is already low. We, we, we are not getting a GFR of 90 ml. We are getting a much lesser GFR. Yes. One there, and there are a lot of areas that I actually did not cover for lack of time. One is uh, hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia. The, the recovery of the mineral bone disease after transplant, uh, this itself takes about a year to recover completely, provided there's a normal graft function. Mm -hmm. So these changes that are there in CKD take a long time to really recover. So some of these uh, mineral bone disorders could actually persist for some time. And uh, if the graft function is normal at the end of one year, probably there is a time when all these normalize. So it is just not sodium, potassium, and acidosis, but there are a lot of other things yes, like the, the magnesium, magnesium, phosphate, uh, the uh, post-transplant mental bone disorder. These are big areas that are normally not looked into by the clinician, and these are uh, areas of research. Yes, the hypophosphatemias, dyslipidemias, serolimus-induced dyslipidemias. So there is, again, a spectrum of post-transplant metabolic abnormalities. That was really an interesting topic for all of us. Dr. Calvini, would you like to give your feedback or your any comments, questions? Your the drawings are already spoken. Like I don't think I have any comments to add. Uh -huh. I think there is one question. There was a question on uh, whether urinary uh, levels of uh, glycolic acid is detected in pH type 2. Uh, yes, that was already responded in Dr. Sukanya's presentation that we can okay. have the, we can uh, screen the urinary panel for the glycolics. Okay. So this one. Yeah, these are not uh, routinely available. They are most uh, uh, in available in research laboratories. Hmm. There's one uh, uh, oxalate uh, center by Dr. Christopher Danpur somewhere in the UK. Hmm. 
So, in fact, uh, a few years back, uh, when I was a student, we used to we tried to send some samples across, but the courier guys uh, could not uh, take these samples to UK. Uh, we had no other go. At, uh, in fact, if you go down into history, uh, um, other than doing a bone marrow biopsy and uh, the uh, the um, arterial biopsies, we used to do kidney biopsies. And sometimes the kidney is small and you don't have any other way to prove or disprove oxalosis. So we used to do an open uh, kidney biopsy and we used to send it to Christian Medical College, Vello, where they used to do a, a, a scoring system called the Sheenman scoring. So where they used to actually calculate the amount of oxalate in the tubules. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is even in end-stage renal disease of any cause, Oxalate gets deposited in the tubules of the kidney. Mm -hmm. But that is only a, the score. There's a calculation for that that has been published by the CMC group way back in 1994 in the journal called Nephron. So the Sheenman scoring was used. So we used to send this uh, sample to pathology, Norman Institute of Pathology in CMC. Bello, and they used to give us a score. So any score of more than 60 was suggestive of oxalosis. So if you're able to do, get a kidney biopsy, there's, of course, nothing like that where it shows extensive deposits of oxalate. But in today's world, I think genetic nobody would... Ex yeah, without genetic testing, I don't think we can actually... Mm -hmm. uh, most important thing is to recognize and then to plan for a combined transplant or a sequential transplant. Because it's disaster. We have, we have seen patients when I was working in the government general hospital where patients would come with a calcified transplant kidney. The chest X, the X ray of the, um, if you take a KUB X ray, you can see the entire kidney calcified because the diagnosis of oxalosis was missed. Of course, there was less awareness about the disease at that time. So somebody comes in with a, a stone is such a common problem in our country, in our part of the world. We live in a very hot tropical climate, and somebody has recurrent stones and then lands up with CKD. So. Uh, the uh, unless you have knowledge about this oxalosis, uh, one has to rule it out. And if there's a family history, a young person, bilateral stones, recurrent stones, stones associated with the renal failure. So these are the areas uh, that one needs to concentrate. I have seen a patient who had oxalate deposits in the Purkinje fibers of the heart. And the patient was coming with a recurrent heart block. And ultimately, it turned out to have oxalosis. So, so that this, this I, I had a collection of 50 patients with oxalosis. Uh, it is very sad that I did not publish it, but these are different manifestations of the disease. Great, interesting, interesting. And that's, that is what which takes us to the spec, other end of the spectrum where so Kenya told the genetics and how the severity of the genetic variation that gives us a different clinical manifestation. How severe is the genetic uh, variation? Dr. Sukenya, had you had your uh, genetics done in any of your patients of oxalosis? Any experience of yours and what type of variation you are getting? Uh, kindly and unmute. And so we do attempt to do the genetic confirmation in all our patients. And uh, we see uh, most commonly, I would see, uh, because the numbers that we do is very little. This being a rare disease, one might not be seeing enough patients to comment on what's the most common variant that we are seeing. But definitely in uh, most of our patients, unless otherwise we have strong evidence or there is already a positive history in the family, uh, we definitely attempt um, uh, a genetic uh, diagnosis and more so in our uh, part of the country in our state genetic diagnosis being now offered in government centers according to the insurance and it's also been covered most of it so we do find uh, ways and means to definitely get a genetic diagnosis and because most of these patients would be planned for a multi-organ transplant uh, vis-a-vis an isolated kidney transplant and most of them do end up in the end stage uh, mm -hmm. to us in the last stage so we do attempt a genetic diagnosis. There's no question of, you know, just not doing a genetic diagnosis. Okay. So we do attempt and all attempts should be made for a genetic diagnosis. I might not be able to answer which is the most common variant in our center or something because the number of cases are quite little to comment on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So with this one, uh, one last coming for, to the earlier spectrum of the oxalosis. Have you have your experience of the enteric and the dietary, the enteric particularly the oxalosis? Uh, 
so I've just had uh, seen one patient who has had an uh, uh, AKI, a young, um, he's a young adult of around 21, 22, who's underwent an extensive uh, intestinal surgery and then had an AKI. Um, so it was thought to be acute tubular necrosis and it was just postponed. The biopsy was done because of non recovery of kidney function where we picked up oxalate crystals in his kidney. And uh, so we assume that this patient has enteric hyperoxaluria. So there was excellent recovery of kidney function after a while, after hydration and all that. I believe there could have been some residual damage, but definitely the kidney function as evidenced by creatinine and his urine output all became normal with aggressive uh, hydra hydration and also crystallization inhibitors like potassium citrate. So that is uh, my very uh, little experience with, uh, you know, enteric hyperoxaluria. Um, and I think in that case, the serum oxalate are also not very drastic to really guide us to observe. I went to the serum oxalate uh, testing in him because his kidney function was recovering. So I would not have uh, hmm. gotten anywhere with the serum oxalate level. Uh, it would not have helped me in the diagnosis or the field. Definitely, definitely. So thank you. Thank you for your uh, extensive uh, discussion and your generous time to the IPNA and Dr. Calvinis and all of our team. Uh, so it was really interesting. Awesome. Sorry to interfere. That is yes. one last question for Dr. Edwin Fernando. Uh -huh. So, sir, so there is three months post-transplant persistent asymptomatic hyponatremia. Serum sodiums between 110 to 115 millimoles how to manage any role of 3% saline administered orally is persistent hyponatremia a prognostic marker for the poor graft outcome. So it's sir, considering hyponatremia. Yeah, you can't be giving 3% saline orally. You'll have to find out why this has happened. Uh, many of our patients, uh, even after they have received a transplant, continue to be on a very low salt diet and continue to be on a CKD diet instead of coming back to a normal diet. Mm. So this I found is the main reason why they, they generally tend to be very weak. And then uh, they have uh, low salt intake and especially in a weather like ours, uh, hot, hotter and hottest. Uh, that is the uh, weather that we have. So uh, before embarking on treatment, go through a detailed history, look at the prescription, look at the drugs to see whether there could be any drugs that can cause hyponatremia okay. and try to sort out instead of giving 3% saline. The most important thing is to identify the cause rather than the treatment. And somebody who's got a, a chronic hyponatremia, there is no rule for giving 3% saline unless the patient is symptomatic. If he's asymptomatic, you must try to find out the cause, increase his salt intake, look at his prescription and try to avoid something, drugs that could uh, produce this hyponatremia. So, so, so good. Initially, we should try to evaluate the underlying cause of the hyponatremia. Cause. That is most important. Correct. And the symptom, symptom is how much is the symptomatic our patient. But, uh, but oral three percent if needed, we can give. There is no harm in uh, continuous or maintenance three percent oral. But uh, how long would you keep giving this? So, unless you find out the cause. Yes, definitely, definitely yeah. to evaluate the cause. Thank you. Thank you for your response, sir. So I think now we are coming to the end of our session. And I'd like to thank uh, both of our eminent speakers, Dr. Namalwar for being with us on board, Dr. Calvini for organizing and persistently continuing with the webinars for the teaching and training of not only for the juniors, but also refreshers for all of the seniors. So I thank you all for your presence and uh, thank you and goodbye from my side. We'll stop the session here. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Asim, for having the excellent moderation. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. We'll work together, inshallah. Thank you for joining us from Karachi. Nice yeah. to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.